India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal India Quarterly is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good afternoon all. I welcome you all to the ICWA webinar on the Eastern Mediterranean. 
a new geopolitical hotspot amidst Turkey Greece tensions. The tensions in the Mediterranean are nothing new, uh, with Greece and Turkey facing standoffs over multiple issues since 1970. The recent tensions began in July August 2020 when the Turkish government declared its intent to, sell, uh, to send research vessels in the water, which are claimed by the Greek government. The move was considered as a part of Ankara's wider energy exploration efforts in the eastern Mediterranean. Although on surface it appears to be divergences over energy exploration, but if looked at closely, the dispute points towards the larger issues of overlapping maritime boundaries, interpretation of UNCLOS, and questions of delineation of continental shelves. Turkey and Greece have overlapping claims to this energy-rich area, and they contest each other claims. The tensions in the region are multi-layered and multi-dimensional in nature, and the region's fault lines are combination of traditional disputes and emerging realities. Over the course of today's discussion, we plan to explore the reasons for the recurring tensions between stakeholders and also examine the quest of energy exploitation by various regional players and what are the other factors that are acting as contributing agents to this instability. The involvement of multiple actors like France, Egypt, Israel and Libya has turned this region into an active geopolitical zone with issues and actors converging from EU and MENA region. To deliberate on the issues of overlapping maritime boundaries and sovereignty claims, various military postures and how the current situation has the capacity to deteriorate the security in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have with us an eminent panel. The session today will be chaired by Professor Bimal Patel, uh, Director General, Raksha Shakti University, Gujarat. Our panelists for the discussions are Ms. Priya Singh, Associate Director, Asia and Global Affairs, Kolkata, Dr. Taibul Long Kanastyu, Center for European Studies, JNU, and Dr. Fazul Rahman Siddiqui, uh, Research Fellow, Indian Council of World Affairs. Now some housekeeping rules. You're all requested to keep your mic on mute Questions and comments from the audience can be submitted via chat box, which would be visible to the chair. I request now Professor Patel to kindly give your opening remarks and conduct the today's proceedings. Thank you, Ankita. Uh, it has been my pleasure to chair this webinar. Friends, having studied more than 50 law of the sea related disputes before the International Court of Justice. Out of the total docket of 178 cases, including the Aegean Sea dispute between Greece and Turkey, I only can say the current developments have far reaching implications for the law of the sea in general and the UNCLOS in particular. While studying the South China Sea dispute, I became, five years back, acutely aware that if coastal states with some of the largest coastlines in the world fail to appreciate the importance of customer international law and UNCLOS, how those who are abiding by the principles and provisions of the UNCLOS will be able to maintain peace and stability in the oceans. Is it possible that inconsistent practice and unilateral interpretations continues will pose a threat to international peace and security in particular regions? As interests, and although aware of needs, interests, and concerns of states, and I emphasize the needs of states, the interests of states, and the constants, concerns of states, with India, Cyprus, Greece, or China, Vietnam, who are parties to unclose, or US and Turkey, who are not parties to unclose last decade political developments are cause of significant concern to the entire 
oceans and peace loving community of the world we have already have several substantive issues pending out of the unclos and which need multilateral resolution or understanding and the current stalemate in the eastern mediterranean necessitates that upholders of unclos principles and practices pay critical attention so as to prevent control and reduce any major damage to the constitution of the ocean i am therefore thankful to icwa for taking the lead in organizing this panel discussion and inviting me to chair the session i am thankful to my colleagues on the panel and look forward to understand their analysis and put it proper perspective within the unclos let the marks as a chair i will try to identify the issues and there are some issues which i will simply enlist because i believe that those are more of a political nature which may be discussed in a different forum i am sure the world is watching this webinar with requisite interest and particularly covid 19 pandemic allows us to participate in such webinars more extensively avoiding the need to travel the first issue the territorial waters in the again the territorial waters claimed by turkey and greece are still at 6 miles the possibility of an extension to 12 miles has fueled concerns of turkey over a possible disproportionate increase in greek control space turkey is not a party to unclos as i said which is the constitution of the ocean and represents customary international law even us which is also not a party does recognize that unclos represents customary international law us had dispute indeed with regard to the deep sea bir mining chapters of the unclos and as a, as a result we had completely new additional protocol to unclos it is indeed true that unclos as res inter alio secta that is a treaty can only be binding to the signing parties but not to others greece in conformity with the entitlement given by unclos apparently wishes to use right to apply this rule and extend its water to 12 nautical miles at some point in the future although what i understand it has never actually attempted to do so and it holds that the 12 mile rule is not only treaty law but customary international law as per the wide consensus established among the international community against this if you look at then turkey's argument is that the special geographical properties of the t make a strict application of 12 mile rule in this case what it considers to be illicit in the interest of equity but we can also recognize that turkey itself has applied the customary 12 nautical mile limit to its coasts outside the aegean the second major area of dispute is the national airspace the national airspace airspace is normally defined as we know that airspace covering a state's land territory and its adjacent territorial waters it gives the sovereign state a large degree of control over foreign air traffic while civil aviation is normally allowed passage under international treaties foreign military and other state craft do not have right to free passage through other states national airspace the delimitation of national airspace claimed by greece is unique as it does not coincide with the boundary of the territorial waters greece claims 10 nautical miles of airspace as opposed to currently 6 nautical miles of territorial waters since 1974 turkey has refused to acknowledge the validity of the outer 4 mile belt of airspace that extends beyond the territorial waters of greece and in support of that turkey cites the international civil aviation 
uh, statutes of 1948 as containing a binding definition that both zones must consider, coincide. This is second major area of concern. The third, there is a continental self. The continental self term refers to a literal state's exclusive right to economic exploitation of resources on and under the seabed, for instance, oil drilling in an area adjacent to its territorial waters and extending into high seas. The width of continental self is, we all know, commonly defined for the purposes of international law, not exceeding 200 nautical miles, where the territories of two states, and this is the issue, like closer opposite each other, then double that distance, the division is made by the median line. The concept of the continental self is closely connected to that of an exclusive economic zone, which refers to a literal state's control over fishery and similar rights, and both concepts have been codified and part of clause. The dispute between Turkey and Greece is to what degree the Greek island of the Turkish coast should be taken into account for determining the Greek and Turkish economic zones. Let's see. Turkey argues that the notion of continental self by its very definition implies that distances should be measured from the continental mainland, claiming that the seabed of the geographically forms a natural prolongation of the Anatolian landmass. This would mean for Turkey to be entitled to economic zone up to the median line of the Egan, leaving out, of course, the tidal waters around the Greek islands in the eastern half, which would remain as Greek enclaves. Whereas the Greece, on the other hand, claims that all islands must be taken into account on an equal basis. This would mean that Greece would gain the economic right to almost the whole of Egan. The fourth important development in this regard which has taken place is the claims of Turkey before the United Nations. Last year on November 2019, Turkey submitted to the UN a series of claims to EZ in the Eastern Mediterranean and that are in conflict with the Greek claims to the same areas including a sea zone extending the west of the southern east Aegean island of Rhodes and south of Crete. Greece has, of you know, has lodged objections. What is the Turkey's view? Let's look at the Turkey's view. Turkey holds a view that unlike most other 11 states, that no islands can have a full EZ and should only be entitled to 12 nautical mile, reduced to EZ or no EZ at all rather than the usual 200 miles that Turkey and every other country what considered to be entitled to. In this context, Turkey in December 2019 claimed that Greek island of Castello Rizino shouldn't have any EEZ at all because from the equity based Turkey's viewpoint, it is a small island immediately across the Turkish mainland, which as we, as I mentioned to you, has the longest coastline and is not supposed to generate maritime jurisdiction area, which Turkey claims that it generates 4,000 times larger than its own surface. Furthermore, according to Turkey, an EEZ has to be coextensive with the continental self based on the relative lengths of adjacent coastlines and describe any opposing views supporting the right of islands to the EEZ as maximalist and uncompromising what Greek M claims. Turkey sometimes in the beginning of this year also challenged the rights of Greek, uh, sorry, even the rights of Crete, the largest of the Greek's island and fifth largest in the Mediterranean, stating that, and I just quote, that they talk about continental self around Crete, there is no continental self around the islands, there is no such thing there it is only sovereign waters. Now friends, if you accept the Turkish position for the sake of argument, and no country, no country who have signed the clause would share this interpretation. It is simply absurd. If you look at the unclosed state practice and the ICG jurisprudence, 
let me tell you, more than 50 cases <clears throat> in and around Love the Sea have been settled by the ICJ and nowhere close to this view has been taken by the court and for that matter, none of the judges, none of the judges in their dissenting opinions have taken such a view. Turkey, as I said, is not a party to the UNCLOS and argues that it is not bound by its provisions that award islands maritime zones. The UNCLOS and particularly Article 121 clearly states that the islands can have exclusive economic zones and continent itself just like every other land territory in a different context and different region, let's say. China asserting that these generate the islands, which is disputed islands, EEZ and continent itself. And China, as we all know, has gone out, all out, way to decry the arbitration on South China Sea, which is again not the latent spirit of the clause. We are not discussing here South China Sea, but what is similarity is that Turkey and China are undermining the UNCLOS for national interest and geopolitizing the peace and stability of the waters. And as I said, the constitution of the ocean. Besides these points, what we all need to understand are some of these disputes which clearly have implications for the larger law of the sea, but also the peace and stability, as I said, in different regions. And these are the issues, for example, the Turkey and Government of National Accord of Libya Agreement of November 2019, the Greece and Italy EEZ Agreement, the Greece and Egypt EEZ Agreement, the Eastern Mediterranean Pipeline, the flight information regions, the demarcation, the Turkey's military overflights, and if you look at the disputed islands, so those are demilitarized status, Lemnos and Samutras, Dodonkanes, Lesbos, Chios, Tamos and Ikaria. There are issues with regard to grey zones, such as Emia or Kardak, between Chios and Turkish coast, Antipsara, Ulnoi, Arkoi, and the list goes and on. And therefore, it is very important that one of the important party, funding party of the UNCLOS, India, through the Indian Council of, uh, uh, Indian Council of World Affairs, is organizing this important seminar because India has an abiding interest in ensuring that all countries, regardless of whether they are party to the UNCLOS or not, abide by the customary international law, which is the reflection of the UNCLOS. And therefore, as we as we implement the innovative practices, it is all possible that we will be if we, if we do not remain vigilant, then we would have greatly undermined the peace and stability, which is the fulcrum of the UNCLOS. So it is in this respect, I'm very happy that my colleagues today are joining and discussing um, various aspects of the Eastern Mediterranean region and why it is becoming hotspot. And um, I would be very happy uh, at the end of the uh, discussions to take upon the question answers from you as well as from my uh, panel members. So I give it over to uh, Ankita. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patel. Now, can I request you to kindly conduct the session, invite our panelists to give their presentation? Sure. Um, so my first panelist is Ms. Priya Singh. Um, of course, uh, Madam Priya Singh has very extensive um, CV, and I would say that she's Associate Director in at Asia in Global Affairs. She has been a fellow of Mohlan Abdul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies in Kolkata. Um, and she is a political scientist with a linguistic understanding of some of the regions she covers. Uh, without much ado, uh, Madam Priya, I would invite you to 
share your um, uh, presentations and I would also request you to stick to the timeline uh, so that you know we can have a very interesting question and answer towards the end of the seminar. Thank you. Over to you, Priya. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Patel. I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and uh, at the outset, of course, I wish to thank the Indian Council of World Affairs uh, for the invite, particularly Deepika Saraswat. And uh, I would uh, like to begin by saying that since between Ankita and Professor Patel, uh, we've more or less covered the nitty gritties in the sense of what you know the legal aspects are the fact that with An ankita's very nice brief introduction where she basically explained the various you know fault lines you know we are talking about uh, you know uh, the problems with regard to maritime boundaries we are talking about age old disputes which have been accentuated by you know uh, the recent uh, postures you know the military postures and the political rhetoric mainly by Turkey and Greece and of course you know with their own alliances and alignments that uh, reflect the various economic zones that you know EEC is that uh, Professor Patel was talking about. I'm going to be very brief with just seven points and I hope we can you know spend more time in uh, the discussions because most of us sitting here know what the details are. So uh, I begin by saying that you know uh, we are actually talking about a region where the geoeconomic of the region is basically one of the most important factors grounded on geoeconomics, the geography and the economics of the place. We have a, uh, you know the geo strategy, the geopolitics, you know the way we respond to it and the various re responses by the various actors. Uh, of course, you know, uh, since the last decade, particularly the last five years, there have been a number of, you know, gas field explorations by Egypt, by new discoveries by Egypt, Israel. And of course, you know, as soon as that happens, you have, com uh, you have new alignments, you have uh, powers, say from the Euro European Union, in this case, mainly Italy and France with their companies telling in Reap to reap in the profits uh, for the European markets. So the geoeconomics of the place, which has changed drastically with the recent gas, you know, uh, with the discovery, with the exploration of uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, gas resources, the hydrocarbon resources. I'm talking about. So, say, if you could, uh, it is not a starting point, but 2015 with the Zohar oil field, gas fields in Egypt again is is a major point there. And of course, you know, the various competing actors there. So that is it. But this was, uh, you know, founded on something which has started much earlier. The Mediterranean, you have to look at the history of the space as well. We've, uh, you know, concentrated so much in the past on the other side of the Mediterranean. We're now talking about, you know, the maritime boundaries, the problem, uh, you know, the disputes regarding the maritime boundaries, which had basically along with you know the fact that this is now a resource rich area in a world in a post pandemic world where resources we these resources are going to play a very important role the political rhetoric the you know the military postures are all situated on top of this you know because most of the countries that you look you know most of the countries involved aren't really countries which are uh, economically very strong now, I mean, you, you have a global recession now. So nobody is really going, you know, great uh, right now. So they are faltering economies. They have lots of, you know, economic issues at hand. And uh, uh, b basically the kind of posturings that are taking place has to be understood in this context, you know. For them, the socio-economic options, alternatives, are probably the best response to deal with, uh, you know, the, the rhetoric. Now, when I'm talking about hydrocarbons and gas pipelines, the geoeconomics of the space, it also requires, obviously, a lot of cooperation undersea, territorial cooperation among nations. 
Probably, you know, when we talk about the space being a space mired with conflicts, even in terms of history, we are going, you know, where I'll, I'll just get back to that. You need to understand that there is also probably one of the best ways to, you know, uh, of course, you know, the various uh, alliances and the laws are there. But one of the best ways probably is to develop a healthy infrastructure of pipelines and international governance, you know, from local to regional to global, you know, this governance is required. We are living in an extremely local world. These, the fault lines that were local and then became regional have now acquired a global dimension, a global dimension. So there is also the issue of governance. That I think international governance, starting from the local point to, you know, uh, as we move to the various tiers. So that is where I think, you know, one of the solutions to this problem lies, you know. Uh, uh, we've all talked about the Belt and Road, the initiative and how it's, you know, the merits and the demerits and how it's going uh, wrong with Professor talking about, you know, China there. But this is again, I think, a, a smaller space. What about cooperation here? You know, this is also a belt, a gas line. You know, we need to develop that. This is one of the most important things that we need to do. And it is an, uh, you know, a shot at internal international governance. Now, in terms of the geopolitics of the space, of course, as uh, you mentioned, there are various alliances. You, know, you have uh, the issues between Turkey and Greece are not new. You know, you can actually, and Cyprus, you can talk about 1974, with, you know, when the Northern Cyprus comes into picture, you know, the uh, coup by uh, the Greeks and, you know, the, uh, the Turkish invasion and the creation of, you know, this Northern uh, Cyprus Republic, which is, uh, you know, basically, uh, again, you know, the, uh, you could, the factor of ethnicity comes here. So we are not just talking about international laws and, you know, just not international relations. There are various, various tiers to it, you know. And when we talk about the conflict, you know, uh, you take Greece, you take uh, Turkey and Cyprus, whom I think are the clear, key players here, and their respective alliances to be contextualized in the recent context, you know, what is happening in the world today. For example, you know, the dynamics between how the internal dynamics has changed. When you're talking about geopolitics, you're talking about internal dynamics between Turkey and Israel, how it's changed. How the internal dynamics between, uh, you know, Egypt and uh, Turkey, you know, and how it is also related to resources with each discovering a resource and being tapped by a European power and how you know, this plays at various levels. So you have, as, as again, Professor Patel talked about, you know, uh, the Greek inroad into Libya, you know, with uh, its own memorandum of understanding with the GNA. Uh, this again, one could also think in terms of, you know, the Libyan civil war. Uh, civil war, you know, it's in the aftermath of uh, not, uh, an, an unstable Syria, uh, Libya in the sense. And so you go back to the Arab uprisings. So there, there are a lot of factors at play. The, un the basic instability of the multiple regions which are crisscrossing are interwoven here. So I think one needs to look at that also and one needs to contextualize these. Uh, Regarding the history bit of it, you know, one could actually go back there too important. I talked about 1974. Now, I'll talk about, you know, 1924, the Treaty of Lausanne. That is where, you know, the boundaries of Turkey were identified. And, you know, this entire Turkey is probably the most important player here. So you now have an assertive Turkey, which has its own maritime strategy, the blue homeland strategy. This is again, you know, looking for what it things are lost opportunities. You know, a kind of going back to what happened in the Treaty of Lausanne, new Ottomanism, you know, a go, you know, harping on to, you know, that phase where they have, they need more, they need to exercise more leverage. And this is what has always been Turkey's contention that it is their space. When you're talking about, you know, the geopolitics, the international laws, you also need to talk about how the individual players are working, what is happening inside, within the countries, you know, whether it is, you know, Turkey, whether it is, whether it's the three key players and the surrounding players. So Turkey here again is assertive, going back to its, uh, you know, new Ottomanism policy. And 
it becomes a very important when you uh, talk about uh, you know its its uh, ability or its uh, willingness to uh, secede or to you know kind of go back depends upon how it frames its policies you know and and this entire thing of uh, you know having an assertive policy uh also as i said you know one needs to uh, really take into account the fact that uh the pandemic has basically changed the economic you know uh, trajectory in an interesting way now i was talking to a person in calcutta who trades you know who's been having this you know trade relation uh, he has his business with turkish partners and uh, the weak lira and the uh, cheap wage uh, you know laborers available in turkey are actually actually puts turkey in a somewhat vantage position in what has been you know a sort of global recession i'm not saying things are uh, very good in turkey you know it's it's not like what was in the first you know phase of the edoan era but turkey still has this advantage of you know having an economy which probably will fare a wee bit better than the other contesting players so you know when i when you talk about all i'm trying to say is when we are talking about you know the various rules the various economic zones we are talking about the you know the discretions the the laws that have been you know violated we need to also keep these in mind that there is a particular context within which we are operating and how each of these players are playing you know are acting in that stage also the fact that the united states is somewhat you know uh, is no longer as vocal as it used to be you look at the trump administration it ha- it, it it isn't consistently pressurizing turkey as it you know one would uh, you know expect it so you have germany playing a mediating role and uh, france of course obviously where libya goes you know and uh, you have french companies france is immediately you know going away from turkey so you know these various knots that need to be unknotted in order to understand the space and i feel it's the domestic factors which are also very very important and the trajectory that i would like to follow is from local to regional to global and say everything should be contextualized in a global world thank you very much sir uh thank you um, ms priya singh um so now we would have uh, dr taibur lang and um, dr taibur lang uh, is he there because like you see he is i am here i am here I'm okay here. no okay yes i can see thank you hello hello uh, so he uh, uh, dr taibur lang is um, yeah. assistant professor at european studies in the school of international studies at jawaharlal nehru university uh, he is also coordinator of ma program in politics of the school of international studies and um, very interesting that his research interest includes eu's foreign security policy and i think um, you would have great uh, information from you as we are looking at the eu economic zone not only greek economic zone but eu economic zone and uh, borderland studies so uh, i'm very happy that you have accepted the invitation uh, dr taibur lang and um, i will uh, hand it over to you uh, so it is your turn now uh, uh, thank you sir thank you uh, professor patel and i would like also place my thanks to the icwa for inviting me for this um, this panel discussion as well as uh, the other uh, members of the discussion and the audience uh, well um, like i said like since i am from the uh, school of uh, national studies and the center of european union so european studies i mean so i would like to focus on exactly on what exactly is the european union's role as an actor in this uh, present crisis and like uh, dr priya singh has just mentioned there are multiple actor engaging in this and then we need to contextualize from the history the region so on and so forth 
That way we can look at the European Union as one of the most important actor in this current scenario. And of course, within the European Union, we see now within this crisis, the European Union is there. Then we see also, like rightly said by Dr. Priya Singh, that Turkey is an important player. It's an important actor that leverage on all sides. In the whole crisis that are ongoing crisis, that start way back from the night 2014, 15, uh, refugee crisis, uh, the Arab Spring, the post-Arab Spring, Turkey has been at the center. Then to complicate the, the, the scenario, then you have Greece and Cyprus as a member of the European Union, as a member of the European Union, which uh, in the beginning, it looks like if you go back, like Dr. Piercing said, the history, if you look back at the history, it looks at one point of time, like the issue of the Cyprus question will be settled with both uh, the blessing of Turkey and the other and Greece. But it did not happen that way. The moment Greece became a member of the European Union in 1881, then it put a leverage again against Turkey. By the time Cyprus became a member again in 2004 uh, as a member of the European Union, now what we see is that just a few days ago, just a few days ago, on behalf of Greece, you see that, right, that Cyprus, Cyprus, in fact, vetoed the European Union foreign, uh, what is known as a foreign policy uh, agenda or the, the idea of putting a sanction against Belarus or taking any action against uh, Belarus or a directive or an action or any kind of a statement against Belarus unless until the European Union put a similar action against Turkey. So in that context, we, we, we could see that why is that the EU cannot do anything here. The EU cannot do anything simple is that the EU is an international organization, rightly said. It did have this what they call the common foreign and security policy in place. But this common security policy, it's based on a consensus. So any veto from one member state would put a stalemate on all the other agenda that the, or the plan of action the European Union would try to do, we would try to take. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I, I would put here to say that nevertheless, but the European Union did have a Mediterranean policy. There exists a Mediterranean policy of the European Union. It's not that it's not there, that it comes only at this particular moment. But this Mediterranean policy, it goes a long way back from the 1970s, which uh, start with the Euro, uh, Euro-Arab Dialogue of 74, then came, <clears throat> which under the rubric of what they call the Global Mediterranean Policy of the European Union. And then, of course, by the 1995, you have the uh, Euro-Mediterranean Partnership. And subsequently, you have what they call the European uh, Neighborhood Policy of 2004, and then you have what you call uh, the Union for Mediterranean. So in all these, we see that there is, uh, there is an attempt from the part of the European Union to shape a Mediterranean policy, uh, partly because the European Union wants to play in the 1970s, it really need that policy as a result of what we talk here now, the resources uh, of the disruption to the European, the then European uh, community economy, when it was just blooming, but then the Arab-Israeli war itself sought to sought to disrupt that uh, energy supply. So we have that, that the European Union came out with the global Mediterranean policy and the Euro-Arab dialogue immediately. And following that, following that, the European Union keeps on. But by the time it comes to the 90, the European Union also had started uh, looking at its own security and focusing on its own security as the end of the Cold War. And then at the same time, also it, with the, with the, what, what the development of what we call now the European Union and the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, it started to warn itself to play a major actor role as a global actor. So this is uh, the main thing that it started to focus on the Mediterranean. But focusing on the Mediterranean is also part of its security agenda. One is the post 9-11, and the other one is uh, the, the, the Arab Spring. 
and in both these cases it called for what you call the european uh, called the mediterranean security which are uh, laid down more emphatically in the european union uh, security strategy of 2003 and the most latest one is uh, they call the european union global strategy of uh, 2016 which says like if i quote it says that the european union says that as european we must take greater responsibility for our security and it uh, and it it identified that foreign security policy as an important component of that and it identified the area of the mediterranean that is the southern mediterranean of the north africa and the eastern mediterranean as an important area of focus and in all these policy i will not go in detail but in all this policy the european union start first with the idea in the earlier time with the idea of democracy promotion human rights promotion so on and so forth but by the 90 and all as the 90 comes out the early 2000 come out instability in the mediterranean the migration the flow of migration towards europe then european union also all in member states started focusing on rather govern rather than human rights democracy promotion now it started looking at development activities development activities in a way that it started doing business with the regime of uh, Gaddafi or in uh, Libya or in Tunisia so on and so forth without taking much into consideration of this uh, democracy promotion that it uh, is striped for so but when the Arab Spring happened when the Arab Spring happened so that itself opened a, a lot of can of worms for the European to reflect on its policy in this region. How is that done? Uh, it put on the vulnerability of the European Union security, especially the 2015. The 2015. And while the European Union started to securitize its border, but it did not help much because a lot of these migrants by that period of time, the irregular migrants, as we in the show of Europe. So it started to take the security agenda as part and parcel of its strategy, which one of that is another player, importantly, is Turkey. And the deal with Turkey is to provide a 3 billion to deal with the migrants to settle in the border part of, uh, to process the migrants and refugees. So that itself, that Turkey itself holds the card now of the tap to open and close of the refugee flow. And in, in this crisis now, Turkey is itself as one of the important bargaining chip of the migrant, plus the other 3 billion that bargains on the ease of access of visa access for Turkish to Europe. So you have that. While Europe is ready for this security, uh, then but among the member states, among the member states, there's no clear you have no clear, uh, clear, uh, clear mandate, as we can say, because if you look at France and Italy as the two major players again here, and we can see like what Dr. Priya Singh said about uh, Libya. While uh, Italy would support the uh, the national government recognized by the UN, France, yes, that support, but France was more or less supporting the, the rebel group of by General uh, Khalifa Atta, uh, uh, Haftar. So there is a mismatch between, and both are looking, of course, to the resources of Libya resources as well. So you have that, that you have this, and by, by, by looking at this crisis, by looking at crisis, we could see that now that the Cyprus, Greece, Turkey crisis, that the European, from the part of the European Union, not much has been visible that way, except for the same similar statement that the European Union has given a long way back when Cyprus joined the European Union, that it would recognize as the whole of Cyprus as a member of the European Union. And even during that time when Cyprus applied for membership or the Annan plan, the, the United Nations uh, then United Nations plan for the settlement of the dispute that the European Union made it clear that even if there is no such uh, resolution to the reunification of Cyprus, still 
the southern part will always be will be a member of European Union. So so far, coming back to the maritime dispute, so far the European Union, as all member of European Union, are abide by the law of the United Nations law of the sea convention. They are part of that, but as European Union, it it, it hands its tight. Honestly, that is hand is tied because as Turkey as one of the important player, then you have Greece and Cyprus as another player there, which it cannot much do. So what do we learn from here? To 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 give in a, in in a nutshell, I I would say that to look back at here as European Union um, foreign policy in this current crisis, that over the last ten or twenty years, the European Union has been mainly focusing about its own security its own security and its policy has been taken the European Union has taken the military policy as a whole but rather as uh, we would see that the Mediterranean it consists not of a one whole Mediterranean itself but a different sub region within the Mediterranean the eastern the southern the Balkan side so there are so so a common security approach is the biggest challenge to the European Union to address this crisis and and moreover, like I said, the, the term European security is always looked from the European point of view, but not from the point of the other players. And there are, as I, I would, I would reiterate again, there is inconsistencies between various EU policy framework, like I mentioned, the Euro Mediterranean, the uh, Europe for Mediterranean, the Eastern, uh, uh, the European neighborhood policies, so on. There are so many policies of the European Union, but all of them there are one or the other overlapping or inconsistent with the other. And and one of the criticism that says that the European Union could not do much because at the end of the day, that foreign policy objective are still the sovereign at the heart of the sovereign state. That no matter what the European Union has a good intention, but the European Union still lack it cannot do an intervention because it still lack the military and defense capability, and its foreign and security policy depended very much on member states. So in this crisis, it has no it has a role to play as a mediator, as maybe perhaps pressure Turkey, but even the pressure on Turkey. It cannot go for any more longer because even the Turkish um, application as a candidate to the European Union is almost as good as dead. It's almost as good as dead because, and if you see by 2018, uh, the European Union members, some of the European mem members like uh, Germany and all, make it very clear that they were concerned of the Turkey application is not moving further to be part of the European Union, but rather than is moving backward as a result of Turkish record on human rights and other issues. So to put that carried on Turkey on the application of uh, its application towards membership to European Union, it, it doesn't have much of a strength now, as we see, as I can see now. But rather it's a Turkey with is hosting millions of refugees inside this territory that has more of a leverage in terms of these uh, the issue that is uh, at hand, as you rightly pointed out, uh, uh, Professor Bima uh, Patel, Professor Patel, like you said that Turkey is not a member of Uniclos, so it's hiding within that, within that, that we are not a member of Uniclos, Uniclos, so we cannot take that, rather put, have a leverage on the other side. So these are the fact that the European Union policy on the Mediterranean as it is right now. So I think I should end there. And I will look forward for questions which maybe we could address more issue from the part of the European Union. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Taiwan Lang. Um, good, because you know you brought a very interesting perspective of um, very specifics of the needs and concerns of the European Union and within European Union the differing positions of let's say Italy and France vis-a-vis -vis the particular regimes in Libya and in Greece. So I think it is going to be a very exciting debate when we start the question and answer because uh, I'm now looking forward to what uh, Dr. Siddiqui has to add. 
because now we have heard an excellent uh, expose from uh, Dr. Singh and Thaibo Long, and now I'm turning to Dr. Siddiqui, uh, who is associated with uh, ICWA. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui obtained his PhD from uh, Jawaharlal University, and um, his research area is political Islam, Arab identity politics, and foreign and strategic policies of Arab countries. And his book, Political Islam and the Arab Uprising, Islamic Politics in Changing Times, was there in 19, uh, 2017. So I look forward to listening to his remarks and how the particular work which he has done in 2017 also has some implications for the dispute or for the uh, tensions which we are currently witnessing in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I hand over to you, Dr. Siddiqui. It is now you. Thank you. Yeah, you're, can you please unmute your mic? Thank you, sir. First, let me begin by thanking ICWF for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the subject. The Eastern military and a new geopolitical hotspot. I will confine myself to how Turkey responded to this geopolitical new churning. I will completely adhere to what Turkey is doing and how Turkey is checking and how they are supposed to respond and how they are doing it. Before I move further, I would like to make a few observations. First of all, I will call it a new geopolitical hotspot rather than a new geopolitical spot. Second, the crisis is resurfacing because it has never been resolved. And it was deferred again and again and put up from the chessboard to serve and to accommodate the interest of the erstwhile two superpowers. Today it is resurfacing under a completely new geopolitical context that is loaded with full of uncertainty and the kind of trajectory that is evolving is full of nobody can predict where the things would lead to. And this geopolitical uncertainty is because of a lot of permutation and combination which has turning the past foes into allies and today they lied into a force. So you can see how this past enemy are coming friend and today's friend becoming enemies. That we have to see and that is because of this. This entire geopolitical change is coming and that it's full of un well, means contradiction and full of uncertainty. And I would like to also add to one thing basically this what is happening in two parts, Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean part, is quite interconnected. We cannot separate it together. And this today's gas of Eastern Mediterranean is, might become the oil of Middle East in coming years and decades. What has further made this region a new hot spot? US withdrawal from Iraq, rise of ISIS, discovery of new hydrocarbon resources in Greece, Israel, Cyprus, and overactive foreign policy of Turkey that we have been witnessing over a decade. These are the factors that really added a new value and a new weightage to this entire territory and the region. These are the few observations that I have made. Now I would like to come to directly to what what Turkey, how Turkey is behaving in the region for the last 10 years, particularly in, after the dawn of Arab rising. Here I would like to mention in particular the much talked about zero problem with the neighbors. And with this slogan, Turkey entered into, into kind of new engagement with the Arab world. They started a new beginning after being estranged to each other for almost five decades. They started doing trade and commerce, they, they played mediating role in Palestine, in Afghan Pakistan, in Syria, in Iran. So they were quite active in this. But what happened suddenly after the Arab rising, 
the entire policy of zero problem turned into a zero problem. New kind of they started, but their foreign policy become, became quite congested basically. Today you can see in the entire region, Turkey is everywhere. From Egypt, Libya, to Syria, to Iraq, they had different pursuit for the military base in Qatar, Somalia, Sudan, Cyprus. So you can see the over engagement. And this over engagement is not coming at the behest of these countries. These countries are not liking it. Today, I think Turkey seems to be very much isolated, except Qatar, I think, if you see, the monarchies, they don't have any ties. Egypt, as I mentioned, everywhere, I think they don't have any friend except Qatar, I think, today. And Europe, you can see that. Even the entire NATO and EU is divided how to deal with Turkey. And what is happening today in the region is the culmination of the overactive foreign policy of Turkey. We cannot isolate these both, both phenomena. What Turkey has been doing in the last one decade and what is happening today. Now I will come to the core of the difference between Greece and Turkey. I would like to deal with it. I have divided this section in two parts. One is the historical reason and the second is the immediate factors. Emergence of power by two are imbalance of power in the Mediterranean and the discovery of huge oil and gas for the last one decade have made the region of the most important and attractive destination for the international and regional players. Some of the Turkish media has started calling it, uh, you know, this is it was a neo Ottomanism versus neo Byzantinism. You know, they have they have been projecting this entire contestation in such a way. We are well aware. Of the, I think I, not, I need not to go deep into this. Turkey and Greece relationship, they have an old rivalry, I think. And their maritime issue, their Cyprus issue, their maritime boundaries, territorial boundaries, the 1974 coup and the occupation of Turkey, and all these things, these are the, these are the well known, as it's very much in public sphere. But also, I think these are the historical factors that is determining to the Turkish Greece relationship. What is strikes Turkey basically is this, what uh, Ms. Periyar mentioned that, the 1923 Lausanne Treaty. Turkey claims that Greeks is trying to control the natural resources that is completely disproportionate to its territory. Or Turkey is always haunted by a dream that they are being encircled and they are being completely surrounded and encircled by enemy countries. That basically in a way, compelling Turkey to take or go for an hour in every aggressive posture, basically. Turkey also thinks, you know, Greece is unnecessarily trying to extend its territorial water. It's always had been a very general and common complaint. Turkey, other concern is that Greece is trying to control all the economic resources in the Mediterranean, despite the fact that Turkey is the longest coastal in the East Mediterranean Sea. These are the basically historical grievances that Turkey has been from time to time. They have been registering it to the international community, the UN, all these things. There's nothing new in that. What further annoyed Turkey over the decade, and particularly after Cyprus became the member of EU, from the time to time, Cyprus has been inviting international bidders to make exploration in the oil and gas sectors. And despite expression of displeasure by Turkey and reminding Cyprus and again, anyway, it's a disputed zone, so you cannot take any exclusive issues on that. You have to take into consideration the concern of northern part of Cyprus and Turkey as well. So that has been the basic, and that is how it, these factors have been quite instrumental in building up the situation where we are today, where the Turkey and the entire East Middle East today. Now I will come to the immediate factors. What are the immediate factors? Just before me, Dr. Pia mentioned that about the blue nation, the concept of blue nation that has been very often propagated and preached by this Turkish petroleum company. And they have made a plan that 19, 19, uh, sorry, 2023, Turkey should be 
self sufficient when it comes to oil and gas because today it's a country which is completely in that arena they have a lot of deficit and still they largely depend upon the farming import gas and oil so they want to be completely and they have time they have created a kind of you know new wave to become turkey independent and they are always trying to you know hundred years independent this this and that and they always refer to these kind of laws and treaty i mean we have a lot of injustice has been done and these people these have been given the larger part of territory and the island that uh, given its size greece is not entitled for that what has further envied and angered turkey is you know for the last over a decade the cypress began laying the foundation for offshore gas exploration despite objection from turkey in 2003 cypress signed a demarcating agreement with egypt and it was happening particularly when there was a lot of discussion the kofi annan plan to really to resolve this cypress crisis and then it means turkey thought you know they are really not serious when we are considering and we making all effort to resolve the crisis cypress is taking us independent view without taking into consideration our economic concern our geopolitical concern and all these things what really turned the situation to what i call the worst situation basically then came the creation of the eastern mediterranean gas forum it came in january 2019 what is interesting part of this creation in this is forum was most of the country that were part of the forum they do not have good relationship with turkey for example egypt palestine israel cyprus jordan italy majority of the country today do not have good ties with israel with sorry with egypt so egypt has all it's a sorry turkey has always taken this grouping as the anti turkey club they never accepted this fact these are the immediate factors that have that have been that has played a very important factor in creating a kind of distance between this on the one hand this club on the other hand turkey and turkey is always have the fear that these countries this club are nothing but an attempt to isolate turkey in the eastern mediterranean and despite the fact that they claim they have the real honor because they did this the longest border with coastal border with this mediterranean again 2020 2020 greece cyprus and israel signed another agreement just an attempt to bypass turkey where they could supply the gas to the european country directly that would really give a kind of it will be a great economic loss for the turkey these are the few agreement and these are the few coming those country together which turkey assumed to be enemy country a hostile country that we really basically creating a new kind of fear in turkey that is a complete these countries have come together they have clubbed together to antagonize and to harm turkey economically politically strategically so these were the factors basically last but not the least a tipping point came in january 2020 when turkey signed an agreement with the government of national record in libya that was the really tipping point and that became that was not welcomed by any of the east mediterranean country at that situation reached to an extent where greece called its ambassador back and this after became suddenly the darling of greece and they thought that all the through by this agreement all the previous agreement that these countries Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and Vietnam. That will completely nullify these things. And this Libya-Turkey agreement was the considered to be a a major victory for Erdogan's foreign policy, because by this single stroke he nullified all the thing, and this he forced all these parties to come to negotiation table. And we we could have we could see that how these actors and stakeholders suddenly became active. particularly after this agreement and different countries started reacting in different way and just to counter just to counter this egypt and cyprus again entered a new agreement to nullify this and both started blaming each other see they started as worthless this is illegal and again i would like to mention how this economic and high this hydrocarbon related to geopolitics 
the same Egypt kept on refusing to enter into any kind of agreement with Cyprus on the simple ground that first you go and resolve the issue with Turkey. So Cyprus has requested many times in the past to enter into this deal with Mubarak era and before, before that they refused it because the reason being that in those days Turkey and Egypt were they are having good ties. But you see what is happening is the geoeconomics and geopolitics and geostrategy all are coming together to determine and to shape the entire design, entire this chessboard what we have been witnessing today. And that is what I have mentioned earlier that you know, yesterday food are coming are becoming alive and today the lies are coming into food. So that we can see these are geopolitics, geoeconomic, geostrategic, all factors are playing together to determine and shape the current strategic chessboard. The country which kept on refusing not to enter into a new kind of deal, given the Turkey cyber differences, now today they are welcoming and they are trying to make every effort to antagonize and to isolate and they really stay in Turkey. So that it is quite obvious. What is what are other factors also? Do you know? Over the years, Turkey has given the Turkey growing activism in the region. They have drawn many other players, and all are, all players are trying to enter into any lines that is anti-Turkey. UAE is there, Egypt is there. Saudi Arabia is, is there and they are extending, France is there, they are extending every support to those groups which are against, either against Turkey or against the interests of Turkey. And last but not the least, the refugee crisis. That has further created a kind of deep difference, particularly between Turkey and, and Greece. And we have seen how this, you know, this extremism and the, the kind of media coverage, the Islamophobia, we have, we should not welcome it, we should not embrace it because they really disturb the entire subject. And then we have seen for the last five years, particularly 2015 and 16, a lot of it was created. Now I would like to come to the, where are in this entire game, entire this strategic journey, where is the policy of President Erdogan? You know, Udman is a very expert in occupying the interior with the problem abroad. That is what he has been doing. He has pursued a kind of policy. He always trying to occupy the interior place with the agenda abroad. That is what he has been doing, basically. I think, this, I think you cannot isolate the current situation from the what is happening today. Most of the thing what he is telling, you know, it's a it is political rhetoric and this is it's also for the domestic consumption. And the objective of the parties to the country, the Eastern Mediterranean, are not only economic, it is geographic, historical, as well as individual. It is an effort on the part of Turkey to link energy politics in the Eastern Mediterranean to the wider geopolitical country in the Middle East. Now it's the kind of slogan he is giving, the kind of issue he is raising, it also serving him and helping him to mobilize his workers inside basically. And the election is around and particularly after the Istanbul debacle that he faced, he is making every effort for the 2023 election, for the presidential election and the parliamentary election. That is, is, is quite aiming something else also, not only about economy, not only about hydrocarbon, not only about oil and gas. I think. He is looking beyond that. What I would like to also point out here, you know, he is also witnessing a kind of disenchantment with the Saudi-led bloc in recent years. And particularly in the light of, you know, ongoing normalization of ties with Israel, UAE, Bahrain, Oman and all this. So he is trying to become a, he is trying to exploit this situation and to, and to place himself as the another leader of the Sunni world. And in this regard, I would like to also point out to the new emerging alliance where he was, he was trying to create an alliance between Iran, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, and all these happening in the course of Saudi Arabia. So these are the larger design under the practice of the Eastern Mediterranean crisis to place himself as the real great leader of the Muslim world. 
इट इज ऑल्सो रिलेटेड टू द इंटरनल पॉलिटिक्स हार्ट के रूप हार्ट पॉलिटिक्स की दिखा दी इकोनॉमी गोइंग डाउन इज पॉपुलरिटी कोविश क्राइसिस डाउन इज लीरा क्राइसिस एंड ऑल दीज थिंग दीज फैक्टर्स आर ऑल्सो जस्ट टू डाइवर्ट अटेंशन he has been exploiting these things trying to make it an issue where he could mobilize this his voters in the eastern european part of the world you know just to not to allow the internal political opposition to raise the issue which is common to all uh, dr siddiqui if i if i can just tell you we have yes, to make just that. one minute one minute so what i am trying to say you know these are the their historical reasons their immediate factors existing geopolitical situation in the in the region and moreover urdugan own ambitions in the region these are the factors which have really creating an environment where one cannot see one cannot say with surety where the situation might lead to with these words i will end here thank you very much thank thank you very much siddiq uh, so now the floor is open for question and answer uh, if i if i myself could ask uh, yourself uh, dr siddiqui to what an extent you believe that turkey is concerned about uh, this arab springs fall over effect and to what an extent turkey is uh, becoming restive uh, with regard to this anti turkish club I mean, what what is the strong connection between the two? I would I would like to know from you, and how it will play out. Let's say when when uh, Turkey makes statements in the UN General Assembly, or you know, we heard him uh, uh, talking, you know, uh, day before yesterday in the United Nations as well. So to what extent he he carries over that uh, that he's been kind of cornered, you know. At the same time, he would like to assert, and he's also cornered, and to how it fuels this whole. Uh, uh debate in the east mediterranean so so can you repeat it i'm sorry sir can you repeat the first part i missed it can you repeat so, it sir my question is to what an extent this arab spring fall over effect is critical for turkey to take the stance which it is currently taking everywhere and number 2 to what extent there is a possibility of uh this anti turkey clubbing overplayed uh you know by by for the personal interest by the president uh, what are the chances and how it will affect the whole evolving scenario can can you please put on your mic first i will deal, deal with the arab uprising part and you know immediately after the a prizing most of the commentators were of the view that turkey will be the real beneficiary because it came with islam and if you remember correctly if we remember he was the first one to land up in tunisia and egypt and he tried to tell people you know we are the best option you can adopt because turkey was known in the early phase of erdogan presidency turkey was known for the three things democracy human right and economic performance and he tried to present it as a model to these countries which were passing through this political transformation but suddenly what happened in the span of two or three years when turkey started asserting itself in syria and other countries a kind of in, when they started intervening then most of the country became alert you know for example tunisia so we have not to learn from you egypt started saying we, we do not, not to learn from you to turkey earlier ambition was completely frustrated by the rise of new forces or neutral forces and what we see in the last 2013 and 14 most of the revolution were basically ended in failure to so turkey failed to present itself as a model then erdogan tried to force his idea basically you know turkey is the biggest country and this and that we have experienced democracy we have the islamic democracy and this and that so then they, they went everywhere but internal situation went out of control because evolution lost its flavor basically it became i it was absorbed by different other forces 
so this entire turkey design was collapsed it didn't take more than two to three years for the entire revolution to completely go out of way so that's why i think turkey failed i think turkey failed to make any kind of imprint in any of the countries which has witnessed revolution now the second part is anti-turkey club you know turkey is also trying to pose itself as a victim of the european you know union they have repeatedly made a complaint that you know, despite all our efforts we have not been able to get any access to you and they have branded is a christian club and all these things and they have again and again they have said you know we have made a lot of compromises we have followed each and every dictate in everything that they have tried to tell us if you want to become the eu member you have to follow this this is you have to improve your human rights you have to record you have to reform your judiciary you have to reform this is the turkey has been but they have to so in that way they are playing a kind of victimhood card also not only against the european they are also playing this card against islamic country basically for example the arab countries particularly you know saudi arabia doing this this they are trying to do. but you know turkey what ground turkey has to complain against ue for for establishing tie with israel the, while the fact is that turkey was the first country to establish tie with israel so on what ground you can do that so now they have come up with a third way basically on the one hand they are trying to pull europe as an enemy country, enemy club on the other hand they are trying to gulf countries now they have come up with a new third way where they are turkey is very ambitious in creating a new club for this under its own leadership where iran would be there pakistan would be there malaysia would be there indonesia if the point doesn't know where how it will evolve how it will unfold to what it is success so what is the basic today's turkey entire objective is to place itself as a one of the important regional countries where and for this they are coming with their own usp basically you know they have this islam they have democracy they are the only country where they have proved that islam and democracy can coexist so these are the factors i think that are, and these ambitions have kept turkey engaged not only in the other world but in europe also with pakistan also in afghanistan also in iran also and that, that is how it, i believe uh thank th thank you dr siddiqui do we have questions from uh, audience or participation participants yeah uh, actually we can see it if we look at the, we scroll the chat you know there are individual questions okay, yes. for us uh um, so i can see couple of them for me actually okay so can we can we roll down to those questions uh priya would you like to go for the first one i can yes sir because i have two questions addressed to me uh, yes, i i'll answer them and then you know i think uh, they sure, are explicitly yes sure. to me sure. one Thank by you. professor shakrutta bhattacharya and uh, where she uh, actually is asking me about could you enlighten us on the migration issue across the mediterranean during the time of the or during the time of covid what has been the response of the concerned eu states uh professor bhattacharya thank you for the question uh as far as you know the migration the flow of migration is concerned there's been a trickling stream you know not as much as you know say it was uh, around 2015 and of course you know they've been uh, you know this entire paranoia of accepting uh, boat people if i could use the term which has been actually usurped by the rohingyas it's uh, basically the uh, you know the uh, the harbors be italy calling its harbors unsafe and they've been death report uh, death rep uh, reports of death and uh, greece you know the turkey as well as the you know the un human rights commission accusing greece of high handed policy so this has continued and the blame game the usual blame game you or what actually you know who actually is to be blamed so you know it has been again a tragedy in the smaller scale because there have been streams of people coming from tunisia particularly and they they have been high handed policies in fact my second question which is basically a question addressed to me by dipika saraswat where she talks about i'll just scroll and uh, and i link it to this question you know uh, she is actually asking me about what what is turkey's leverage against the eastern mediterranean gas forum 
from which it is excluded and the emergent Greece, Cyprus, Israel naval axis. Now, since she's used the word leverage, you know, one of the leverages in the larger regional scenario that Turkey has is its, you know, ability or, you know, its uh, willingness to accept refugees. So that has been, you know, whatever has been, you know, the policies, you know, high hand, you know, whatever. Turkey is the valve. So that always, you know, puts it in a vantage position as far as the other European nations are concerned. Now, coming to what has been, you know, uh, Turkey's leverage against this particular forum where it has been excluded, its uh, uh, its leverage lies in its response. You know, it's uh, the MOU which was signed by GNA, which uh, Professor Siddiqui has uh, in great deals, uh, you know, elaborated upon and how the entire game changed and how, you know, there were subsequent, you know, realignments and newer alliances. Uh, and also the second important thing is Turkey's own, uh, you know, the recent the gas explorations under the Black Sea. So Turkey does have, you know, it, this is a very recent event in August 2020. So both in terms of how it has intelli intelligently used, you know, Libya, Libya has, uh, you know, a good, uh, a sizable amount of uh, resources. So its leverage probably lies in its, you know, in the way it's changed the equations and in its own recent discovery. And let's see how it exploits it. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Pia. Um, we have this question from Abhinav Sarkar for um, Dr. Taibur Lang uh, about yeah. Greece and Turkey. Can you, would you like to attempt it? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, yes, yes, I've seen some of the question. Yes, I could see some of the question addressed to me. So yeah, I would like to respond to those. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shay. So yeah, I have few quite questions uh, regarding on one is on NATO, on NATO, and then some are on the role of Germany uh, during this crisis, and as well as the one that. Uh, as on migration on COVID, that of course, uh, Dr. Pia had addressed that, that as well. So, and let me just uh, continue from what Dr. Pia said. And if you look at uh, the issue of migration and the impact uh, during this time, as uh, asked in the, in the question, in fact, if you look from the EU, and its member states' reaction to this migration crisis, we could see it. Immediately, it was caught unaware during the 2014-15, was caught unaware, was caught unaware, and it tried to reform, and it shows that the EU could not do much, especially in member states where, like Greece, Malta, Italy was incapable of uh, providing any kind of relief or effort or to abide what they call these the Dublin regulation, that is the internal EU's regulation on how to process uh, refugees and migrants and refugees. So they could not they could not do much at that time. So the response is that the EU response was, how do we reform the migrate the the issue, the, especially the migration uh, issue? Uh, one way that they could they were talking about uh, the quota system, the quota system that uh, or the burden sharing. The other one is on the enhancing the the role of the security and the, the border or the coast guard in in the coast in, in, in the high sea. So they were talking about this, but uh, if you see these two among these two, the quota system. In fact, just a few days ago, just a few days, it seems that that also is collapsing. Simply because a lot of major other me member states, especially uh, Austria and Hungary, they were not willing to take uh, the quota system. And what the EU now does a few days ago says that they would provide for 10,000 euro for each of the migrant, if they're willing, if each member state willing to take, and the rest you would repatriate back to the country of origin. So the quota system uh, almost now is dead which also fears a lot of criticism from other organizations, the United Nations Human Rights and other organizations, Oxfam and all. So that is gone. But on the other hand, the security dimension of 
uh, of protecting the shore of Europe from these uh, refugee or migrant, as they say. In fact, it's not only during COVID, it has made it more difficult for them in the name of COVID, in the name of pandemic, has made it more difficult for these migrants or refugees to cross the shore to Europe. But not only this COVID, but in fact, this restriction or what you call the border control has been for the last two decades that Europe has put it from surveillance, from uh, either a bilateral agreement with Morocco, with Libya, during Gaddafi and post Gaddafi, even till date, and then the use of um, artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. But border restrictions have become more and more. That's what we call that Europe is, in fact, it's a fortress. It, it's free inside, but it's a fortress for outside to, to come in. So that, that, that itself is not what we say that only in COVID, but in fact, before COVID, there has been a multiple restrictions of, for migrants or refugees to enter Europe. It's not easy as it looks at, as it looks at. And, and the 2014-15 uh, migration crisis, in fact, has further, that restriction has further, has made the EU and its member states clamp down more and more. And one of that quota, the collapse of the quota system or the lot of the right wing and conservative parties uh, government in, in Europe, within the European member state has also shown that the unwillingness or the attempt by the member state to restrict the enter and the entry, the, the enter of migrants into Europe. So that is there. One thing is there. So one. Thing. And now if I go to the next question on NATO and then yes, Greece and Turkey are both NATO members. That's true. And majority of EU member states are members of NATO. That was just true. But we have to also look in the context that for the last few years, in fact, NATO also has faced a lot of problems, especially we see during the time when we see during the presidency of Trump president, this presidency, Trump presidency, we see that how the US has often blame NATO on, or on Europe members of NATO as their lack of contribution towards NATO. That's one thing of it. And this has become also a part of a, of a constant friction within the NATO member state of European and the transatlantic relation. And in, in this, we could see also that uh, the EU now start to attempt to develop its own defense cooperation that will take a long long time but they still have to depend on 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 nato and when we see turkey though turkey is part of this among all these friction and turkey is part of uh, nato but you see that turkey also has been engaging with russia in terms of buying the the s400 defense uh, system while at the same time negotiating with the f35 from the united states so there is a mismatch. In fact, there's a conflict between within that member state, and and on the, on the, on the other hand, we see this more this crisis, especially when we look at the night uh, uh, during the month of June, when the UN put an embargo on on Libya on the shipment of arms on Libya on the sea, and there was a conflict between France and Turkey on the sea regarding the restriction of the Turkish uh, vessel. So we see all these dimension that at the heart of it, within that friction, especially the June, the June 20th, I think it's the June 20th uh, incident, that within the European Union there has been an inquiry of the, the Italian, the Greek, uh, the Italian, the French, and the Turkish vessel, and the, uh, and the, and the uh, Turkish vessel in the sea of um, restricting or putting, trying to put the the UN uh, arms embargo, which the United, which the EU also tried to put it, but then it, among the European Union member states, there are so much disconnection among them that uh, they could not put much. The EU they could not uh, help much in uh, any, could, could not offer much help in terms of resolving that, that tension. So what I see is that yes, Greece and NATO are are part and parcel of member state of NATO. But this friction has started more and more often now, has started to appear more and more often, but it will not lead to a glow. I'll come back to this, to the other question that on the German, uh, German's role in this Turkey-Greece. 
which the German said that, though the German foreign minister said that this tension is it, it, it likely that it fear that it will lead into a war, especially when France, Greece, Italy are engaging in military exercises on the one side and Turkey is on the other side. And what Germany itself is holding the presidency of the European Union, which Germany's role right now is to offer a dialogue of a dialogue as a presidency is sought to present some sort of incentives. We don't know because this is just a few days ago, still ongoing, though there is a, uh, there is a news of a bit of a breakthrough right now. There's a bit of breakthrough regarding the, the talk, that ongoing talk, there's a breakthrough, but we don't know how that will progress. But on the part of Germany's role here is that Germany would try to de-escalate the situation, not only between Greece and Turkey bilateral, but as well as the whole of NATO within the, the structure, the, the, the NATO structure, and provide a kind of incentives to Turkey. And we don't know what kind of incentives. Right now, we don't know incentives. Uh, so we have to wait for that and to see how things develop in the next few days. So that probably we will we'll look to that. Yeah. OK, uh, there are a couple of questions which are addressed to me. So uh, with regard to the extended continental self a question has been posed and of course if the states agree for extended continental self beyond 200 nautical miles uh, the convention allows the unit on close allows for it so the, the answer is uh, relatively uh, straightforward the second question is about um, the share of the wealth the resources which you are talking in uh, in the mediterranean now of course there are a number of uh, estimates but what they consider is about um, you would have nearly 1.7 billion barrels of oil and 3.5 billion trillion cubic meters of natural gas so we are actually talking a huge amount of oil and gas reserves in the eastern mediterranean uh, look at which are the main players so you of course you have turkish petroleum corporation then we have exxon mobile uh, Transtotal, Italy's any from for a long time already, uh, but also there are some of the Asian giants among the South Korean co gas, uh, the Qatar Petroleum, the British gas, and um, the Israel's uh, Dalek drilling and Avner Y. So these are the main uh, operators, one can say, in the region. And um, only there is one region where the claim between Turkey and Cyprus are not coalescing is uh, there are a number of parcels. If you see, you know, parcel is goes on it to 13. So there are 10th and 11th parcels where uh, there is no much uh, conflict between Turkey and um, uh, uh, Cyprus. Uh, the third question which was posed, um, what is the relevance of uh, Eastern Mediterranean for India? So when I gave you the the oil and gas reserves, the India's uh, requirement for oil and gas reserves, read with read together with, who are the members? So Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Italy, Jordan, Palestine, and Egypt. Now they these countries have clearly prepared the roadmap of the Eastern Mediterranean. India has unprecedented good relations with all these countries and India is also acutely aware of the oil and gas reserves which are there so it is definitely in the interest of India that Eastern Mediterranean doesn't become a flashpoint at the same time India can contribute to make sure that uh, within the UNCLOS regime the parties that shall be able to explore and exploit shall be allowed to do it because it is within the UNCLOS. And if there are any disputes, they can sit down together. As I identified, there are gray areas as well. And those are some of the gray areas where, you know, those countries have come together. India itself has, knowing the oil and gas reserves in the Bay of Bengal, have settled its disputes uh, with, Bangla uh, with Bangladesh. So, I think India sets a good example that when the country wants to um, access to these rich reserves, uh, instead of giving opportunity to conflict, uh, and particularly as uh, 
Dr. Pia Singh mentioned, um, the countries can come together and can try to find a solution. But again, the important thing is it shall be in accordance with the UNCLOS. So if the countries want to play a hardball, uh, you know, any country for that matter, then in the long term, it won't be in the interest of any country. So this is what I would like to say about um, India's um, economic, strategic, and political alliances with vis-a-vis -vis East Mediterranean, and what role possibly India can play uh, for the region itself, but uh, uh, for the benefit of India itself as well. So this is what I would like to say about uh, India and East Mediterranean. Uh, does anyone of you have any uh, addition? I yes, Siddhi. Siddhi, yeah. I have to reply two questions. One, one question. It's from Dr. Bhattacharya. Looking at Turkey in particular, is there a common theme running through foreign policy in terms of its adventurism in Syria? Is heavy-handed step against the Kurds? Is destabilizing role in the Mediterranean Sea? And now it's polemic statement on Kashmir. Is there some domestic factor explaining this? In Syria and Kurd, I think this is a, it's more about Turkey security issue. Syria being the border country, I think they have their own concern. Kurd, I think they have their own way to deal with that. It is a very old and long issue that is quite complicated. When it, of course, when it comes to Mediterranean and Kashmir, it is directly related to domestic politics. Because when it say domestic politics, about, about politics of World Bank, it is about political rhetoric. It is about please the own constituency. And it's also an effort to show, see how we are, we are working, we are raising voices for those issues which are related to, you know, Muslim and Islam and all these things. And we can directly see how they have raised the issue of Palestine, how they raised the issue of democracy. And from, and for the last 10 years, it has been the Turkish foreign policy to intervene and to to intervene directly, basically. And Kashmir, I think, we should not forget when President Dugan was here in Delhi in the, during the last visit, here again he raised the issue. And now after his departure, I think in every forum he doesn't have any opportunity to come and criticize and openly side with Pakistan. That has been the part of his larger agenda. As I mentioned, that can be seen as a new kind of alliance that, has, that Turkey is trying to forge, basically. And there a study he spoke on Kashmir. It was completely an effort to please the internal constituency. Nothing more than that. There are various issues. If Turkey is quite serious about Kashmir, they can have their own problem, the Kurdish problem. There are several, several issues they have, but that is not going to affect basically. It was completely and solely a part of a larger design to project Turkey as a champion, as a country which has always stood for the cause of Muslim. It was nothing more than that. And similarly, when he's trying to create this, you know, this economic issue and this territorial boundary and the maritime boundary, apart from those factors, economic factors, he are also trying to talk about in the sum of abstract nationalism, basically. Turkey, basically, you know, we are the Turk and all these things, basically. First, we have to be put forward the Turkish interests. And we, at the same time, those voters who are in that part of the world, he also trying to woo them also, basically. Now, it, 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 he, has always, he has already gone into a kind of election campaign mode, basically. We can see in that way also. So that's the what I had to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Singh, and Dr. Taibur Lai. It I have was, two uh, questions. I, I think I have two questions. I have two questions, I think, new one. Okay. New so would you like to attempt Dr. Would you like to attempt it? Yeah, I'll just take another two. Yeah, I'll, I'll attempt it for maybe just one, two minutes. Go ahead. Maximum. Go ahead. So there is a question from uh, Dr. Stuti Banerjee. One is said like uh, Greece unwillingness and whether, uh, I'll just read the question. That is, uh, the Greek government has made it clear that it's unwilling to negotiate with Turkey until it stops threatening. Uh, what do you, is your opinion for you for what? Do you think the Greek manship will continue? And followed by uh, whether France, whether France will take the lead role now as the main opponent of Turkey and not Greece. 
whether France will replace, whether France will be the main opponent of Turkey and not Greece? Do you think that France is trying to fill the gap of the U.S.? Uh, so, uh, well, uh, the Britmanship will continue for sure. They will, it, it will continue. There was, uh, there's nothing like it will continue. Though Greece has said that it's unwilling, but at the same time, uh, the foreign minister of uh, Turkey also said that Turkey just, uh, I think on Tuesday, that is uh, yesterday, that it's, it's willing to negotiate under uh, on the condition if there is no precondition. And of course, there's our parliamentary language has said to Greece being stopped being bratty and something like that. But uh, the negotiation will stop and and the negotiation will, will will go on, like I said in the previous uh, part, that the negotiation will uh, carry on and the role of Germany as well as the United States, because the United States has entered now, has made it very clear that the negotiation has to be there. And there seems to be, like I said a while ago, that there's to be a breakthrough. And the brinkmanship is like uh, Dr. Siddiqui said, is part and parcel, you know, part of Turkey is part and parcel of the domestic bargaining that is there. But my, the, the negotiation will go on, the brinkmanship will go on. And, and I don't think in this whole, in this whole situation now, I, I don't see that France will replace the United States. But yes, France will play an important role. France will play an important role. Because France, because France cannot replace the uh, uh, United States at the moment. France, I don't think that France will, will replace the United States at the moment, though France become an important part of the negotiation right now, especially when we take in the context of the European Union where France and Germany as the axis of the new European Union post-Brexit, which now, like of course, like Brexit, and it look at Brexit, like how Britain tried to bargain, Britain tried to take advantage of this situation by because it, it looks at the post-Brexit scenario. On the other hand, if you look at France, France wants to offset that by taking a lead role. Of course, France has its own Mediterranean policy along, I mean, from, from the 1800s onward. And for the last few years, France has been looking for to play a, a greater role. And this has uh, been quite evident from the time that Sarkozy was... Uh, the president trying to see that how France tried to find again its footprint in a, as a global, as a major, major global actor, not just a global actor, but a major global actor. So that continues on. And but to suggest that France would uh, be the main uh, adversary for Turkey, I don't think so. No, there'll be dispute, of course. There'll be disagreement. But on the part of the European Union, despite the fact that there is, like I said, a disagreement among member states on how to reach the crisis, but we, we should also remember that the, Europe, the European Union foreign policy works on a constant negotiation and bargaining within the member states. They keep on, so they might come with something that the member state themselves might come with a resolution that is agreeable to France, that is agreeable to Italy, that is agreeable to Germany, that is agreeable to all the major players, and then make a statement, make a statement and try to come as present as a united face in resolving the crisis. Given the fact that Greece and Cyprus are the main uh, actor in the dispute. So I don't think so that France will take a unilateral role, especially in the post-Brexit world where the European Union, especially France and Germany wants to take a leading role in the international affairs. And this regional one, like the president of, um, that uh, I think just uh, a few days ago, the, the, the president of European Council, if I'm mistaken, I forgot. But he said that we cannot be, uh, uh, yeah, when Joseph Borrell, the EU foreign high representative, he said that, that the European Union cannot claim to be the geopolitical power or a geopolitical commission unless and until they, if they cannot, I mean, like, if they cannot solve the, the, the problem in the neighborhood. So that makes very clear that if the high representative or equivalent to the foreign minister of the European Union make the statement, that is very clear that all the members, all the stakeholders to the crisis will sit together and try to reach a deal without upsetting the United States or Turkey or Greece. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tavarla. So I hand it over to Ankita now. Ankita, you would like to say a few words? So I think what we can take away from these discussions is that issues 
are still evolving and they will involve larger questions relating to geopolitics, regional balance of power, quest for economic development, as well as energy security. I think these are the main takeaways from uh, today's discussions. So I, I also take this uh, opportunity to thank you, Professor Patel, for chairing today's session and to all our panelists for such an insightful discussion. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. TCA Raghavan, DGICWA, for his encouragement in basically holding this webinar. Sri Shomen Bakchi, DDGICWA, Ms. Nutan Kapoor Mahavar, JSICWA, and Dr. Nivedita Ray, Director, Research ICWA, for all their support. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the technical team for coordinating this webinar and all our guests for their participations and questions. We hope to see you next time as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita.